I would like to welcome everybody to today's webinar titled Smaller Rural Practices, Learning to Balance Your Patient Care with the CMS Payment Programs. My name is Scott Mash, and as always, I'm joined by my good friend and severe allergy sufferer, Kathy Costello. Um, you'll have to excuse Kathy if she, uh, if you hear some coughing in the background, because she's battling, battling severe allergies. Yeah, I, I have to say it's going to be a little bit hard to translate if I have to go in and, and do uh, a, a little uh, hand signals or anything. So, <laughs> so we'll try to have Scott as translator if I lose my voice. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Thanks, Scott. Now I have to say before we start, just so you don't think I've lost my mind, is that when we get into the first slide, just recognize that a person who shall remain nameless on our staff gave me a slide when I said, I really need a slide that depicts how practices might feel if they're absolutely, totally, totally overstressed. So this is what it came up with and gives the new meaning to the word mad dog. So, but honestly, for the small practices that we deal with, I am sure there are days when you feel this way. So if you do and you just want to ignore myths, we figure you might want to know what's going to happen because what is that going to be, a 4% penalty? Yep, in 2019, any of your providers who don't participate in MIPS, who are Medicare providers, will be penalized, assuming there's not an exclusion. Um, so just make sure you happen to mention that to your providers if you decide that you, you about had it, you're off the deep end, and come the end of the year that you're not going to pull reports or anything. But let's say it hasn't reached quite that level of anxiety, and you're at your normal average everyday total of you know 20 plus patients and the phone's ringing and everything else but you feel like you're managing it what else could you do you can do a very small the tiniest bit of effort will prevent you and your um, practice people from being penalized which is really something honestly in the small practices we have to be realistic I know there are going to be practices that fall into this middle category where, where you you know you want to be able to move ahead but you just don't think you're ready to do the whole thing and if that's the case then there is a way to do that also and that is that you can report rather than all the various categories that MIPS would want you to report um, that CMS wants you to report for MIPS, you'd end up reporting for one quality measure, just one, rather than the six that it would be required, or one clinical practice improvement activity. Um, you can also report your meaningful use, which is now called technology or ACI, but that takes a little more effort. And if you're trying to just get by, I'd say report one quality measure or one clinical practice improvement activity for that covers a three months period in 2017 and report it at the group level and you will be avoiding the penalty for everyone in the whole group. So let's say you're in a small practice and in the past years you have been set up for claims based submission for PQRS and you haven't really made any changes and you, you, your claims went through, your G-coding, you, you're, you're going to avoid that 4% penalty. Right, right. So which is no really effort. Yeah, and you know, for a lot of you who have been struggling for the past couple of years with the value modifier, um, you know, that may seem like a pretty good deal. But if you just want to take it one step further and you want to be the hero that brings home a bonus, then let's see what the steps would be to take you there and keep the MIPS reporting fairly simple for what you need to do um, and hopefully put you on the road to being successful. It really, it's just more a question of organization and planning than anything else. Yeah, and if you're in an organization or group that met meaningful use last year, you submitted the PQRS and you, you, know, you had some, a, a good outcome with that as well, and really, 
under under the MIPS program, there's just one more little step you need to take with CPIA. So it's really pulling together these multiple programs, and from the number of measures or data points that you have to submit, there there are fewer. It's a little it can be a little easier. Absolutely, I think there's CMS. You know us. We we are not shy at telling you when we think CMS pulled a boner or something, but the the reality is here that. I think they did some things very well. They learned from some problems that had been created in the past for the Meaningful Use Program and through PQRS, and they tried to wrestle through it. It took them 3,000 pages of regs to wrestle through it, but the reality is that some of the reporting is actually a lot more streamlined than what you're used to, and so I think it might be helpful for you to at least look at it for your practice. Okay, before we move to the next slide, I should have said this at the beginning, and I always forget. Um, at the end of the webinar, when you click out and you say, hey, we're, you know, leave the webinar, you're going to be presented with a survey. Please take the time to fill out the survey. It's only a few questions, and uh, these surveys help us improve each of our webinars, and also if there's a new topic that you'd like to see, a new webinar, let us know uh, as part of that survey, and we'll see what we can do. So now, an another option that you have with MIPS reporting this year and that we think will, is a huge time saver and, and, and simplifies the reporting is group reporting. If you have multiple providers in your practice, and this is definitely the way to go, what this allows you to do is submit one set, one set of numbers for the technology or also called ACI or meaningful use. One set of measures for the um, for quality and just one set of CPIA activities and have that apply to everybody in the group. Um, and again, this is group at the 10 level, at the tax ID level. Another great thing about group reporting is if you have a, let's say you got three providers in your group, one struggled with VDT or they struggled with secure messaging, but the other two providers did very well. Well, the group setting or the group reporting kind of you know, it, it allows for those that are strong in areas to make up for some that are weak in other areas. Absolute great thing. Couldn't be more happy that they included this in the uh, MIPS program. We're going to talk a little bit more about meaningful use or ACI here in a little bit, get into some more detail. But the dashboards that you have from last year, from the 2016 reporting year, will absolutely work for your meaningful use or ACEI reporting in 2017. There's really, at this point, no need to upgrade. Now, when you look ahead to Stage Street, absolutely you do need to do an upgrade. Uh, but for 2017, have you done your security review? If not, make sure you get that wrapped up it's before the end of the calendar year. You can use the ONC Security Risk Analysis Tool, or SRA tools it's commonly called, if you use an outside group. Just make sure you get that done. Make sure that at least one of the providers in the group has sent an ERX. Honestly, everybody's very, most of the folks we work with, we see very strong ERX numbers, not a problem. Make sure that you're pushing your data over to the portal for at least one patient. Make sure that someone in the group has sent a transition of care or referral electronically. If you've done that, then you avoid penalty just by doing one patient you avoid all penalties under the MIPS program. And again, we're going to talk a little bit more later about if you want to take this one step further. Okay, so as we said, with a little bit of planning and organization, it'll hopefully help you to think about what you can do this year to prepare for this. And you, then the nice thing about the way that CMS has structured this is that if you monitor what your providers are doing, for the rest of the year and you kind of stay on top of it and stuff, you don't have to make decisions in advance about how you're going to report or if you're going to do full reporting or anything else, um, which I think makes it, a, it takes a lot of the pressure off. So if, if you've been involved in meaningful use, you've been involved in PQRS, um, it's going to be kind of a similar type of monitoring, but it's just pulling it all together, as we say, in a more streamlined fashion. So the, the steps to developing a good plan is 
we suggest starting with the clinical practice improvement activities because there are some timelines for that and we will talk about that. In, in many cases the CPIA is nothing more than a, a documentation exercise. Now there's a few cases where that's not true but for the most part you'll see that the CPIA activities you just got a short little narrative maybe a screenshot or two in your cover. Right and when you go to a test at the end of the year CPIA is a yes no question. I mean, it's not that you don't need to document or be performing the activity, but it's not something where you're going to be uploading whole reports or anything like that. You're just creating your documentation both for as an audit trail, but also as a foundation for next year and following reporting if it's one of those areas where uh, they want to show improvement over time. The second part, or the second area that you really want to be looking at is also clinical practice improvement, but there's uh, a subset of the what are 50 to 60 uh, CPIA activities you can select from. Um, 15 of those also cross over, they're considered electronic CPIA measures, and they will get you bonus points in your technology or meaningful use area and we'll show you how that works but so when you're looking at CPIA you want to also notice which one of those will give you bonus points. Then the next step would be to work with your technology meaningful use ACI score. Look at your quality, figure out your transmission method and then we'll review some general questions. And um, as, as you can see from this lovely graphic, you can obviously do stuff in a different order if it helps you. There may be different ways of doing it. You just want to make sure you're covering every area. So let's start with the clinical practice improvement. And start by saying so that those of you who are in this boat can just sit back here for a minute. If you are PCMH certified and have been for at least three months in 2017, you do not have to report on clinical practice improvement. If you are participating in Medicare Shared Savings, ACO, you do not have to report on this. The reason why is that CMS, when they wrote, these, um, wrote the legislation, actually this particular part of the legislation came from the American Medical Association and the American Academy of Family Physicians. And so it was the physician stepping forward and saying to Congress, we feel that there should be taken into account the ability of a practice to show how they are good practices outside of pushing buttons and running reports. And so we want to include some type of a way of rewarding practices who basically use best practices or are meeting certain policy um, requirements or, or desires of either the government or their community or their um, local medical society. And so there are, that's why there are so many different categories that you can select from for this is because they put in so many different ones and, and we'll look at that in a minute. But the question of the shared savings is another um, issue, I mean it goes to the same point, if, if, if you are PCMH, that is the model that all of CMS's future payment reforms in the ambulatory area are now have PCMH put into the model. It is the model they want to see practices use in working with their patients. So that is why you are not required to do any additional work on clinical practice improvement if you show that you are PCMH certified because CMS is like this is what we want you know so you don't need to do anything else. As far as shared savings, shared savings is one of those new payment models and although it does not specifically require PCMH, it was one of the first alternative payment models, they assume that you are going to have to manage your patients do transitional care management and chronic care to be successful in in an ACL model. And so they credit any um, providers who are participating in the shared savings program with full credit in the clinical practice improvement area. And you do not have to document that. The nice thing about 
being in an ACO is virtually all the reporting, we'll tell you the exception, but virtually all the reporting flows to the um, governing level of the ACO and it's not something the individual practice needs to worry about. Okay, as far as the clinical practice improvement activities, um, if you are a small or rural practice and CMS identifies small as being 15 or less providers, you should plan on tracking at least two CPIA activities. The reason I say two is for this year, and this the, the number of points or activities that you need to do may increase over time, but for this year, CMS is looking to have practices report 40 points. And 40 points is divided into categories. So when you look at your CPIA activities, they're going to be marked as either medium or high priority. Medium gets you 10 points, and high gets you 20 points. But if you are in a smaller rural practice, CMS is like, trying to recognize that it's going to be more difficult for you to get this done than it might be for someone who has a whole team that can support them in their reporting needs for all these compliance issues. So for small and rural practices, CMS has cut the requirement back to 20, so half of what a normal practice would have. In order to achieve 20, the most you would have to document is two clinical practice improvement activities. And you may even be able to do it with one, but we'll talk about why you want two as it pertains to getting bonus. Um, you need, again, we have to stress this, timing is an issue here. You need to have been participating for at least three months. That's why we suggest starting here and reviewing the activities and selecting which one, because what you'll see, the list is so extensive, there are gonna be I'm sure the, at least five things that your practice is already doing, but you have to look at the underlying uh, record of what they're asking and make sure that you open that up. And um, I, we put the, the link right in here so that you can go directly to the education section and, and this is one of those areas, as I said, um, we're willing to give CMS credit where credit is due, and they did a very nice job on organizing this part. So if you click through that link, it'll bring you to all the clinical practice improvement activities, and it will look like this. So you, if you decide you wanna um, show, this, is, this would be the link to show that you are participating in the ORS program. So it's the annual registration of the, what is prescription drug monitoring or in the state of Ohio that is called ORS. Now, as you know, any practitioners now who are prescribing controlled substances are required in the state of Ohio to be signed up and using this. So obviously this would be a really easy, easy one for all of you to participate in as far as getting credit for it. We've asked the um, pharmacy board if they have a, like an, a short summary that could be used by practices to demonstrate as documentation that they're doing it, but you all know yourself that you can document this on your own. So, And, and this is one of the oddballs where the, the three months doesn't apply. This is actually right. a six-month and that, that was what I was going to point out. Is this is the reason you want to go in and look at the ones that you're planning on using to make sure that you are meeting whatever the requirement is, because there may be fluctuations, um, sometimes either in the amount of time, although this is an unusual one that requires six months, uh, virtually all of them are three, but there's one or two that have differences to them, or they may require a certain percent of your patients to have that you are using this uh, procedure or uh, best practice um, and it's covering that percent of your patient population. And that's in some of the chronic condition areas, they have that. And your CPIA activity period does not necessarily need to be the same period as your ACI reporting Correct. period. Correct. It can be any three months or whatever the time limit is that they have. Um, and as, as long as you document that your practice or your provider 
has been involved in that for that period of time, then you will meet this. Um, what, what I would say is you want to be careful, though, when you're doing with CPIA because there are just tons that are similar. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in the uh, working with clinical data registries, uh, is there must be eight or ten different um, CPIAs that you can select from that you can report to. So that's going to be important that you make sure that you understand which one you're doing. But as you look at this, this is a screenshot from the CPIA um, website, and it'll give you an activity number on the left, a category number, which is not at this point that important to you, um, and then the weighting. And the weighting is what you know, it tells you how many points you get. So this is a medium activity, so it would have 10 points. And I'll show you why the activity ID is important next. Because there are 15, as I said, 15 measures in the CPIA area that will also get you bonus points in your technology reporting. Now you would think that ones like ORS, where in the state of Ohio, in order to participate in ORS, it is an electronic connection and that you can pick up um, the, your electronic bonus points through use of ORS. But the reality is it's not listed in the list of 15. And I don't know if other states have a different type of system, but I just want to make you aware that when you're looking for bonus points, for your technology or ACI area, you want to make sure that you're choosing them off of this list because these are the ones that have been identified in the regs as the ones that you will get credit for. And you want to go in and look at these and make sure that you understand what it is that CMS is asking you to do to get that credit. For example, if you're running a Coumadin clinic or a diabetes management, you really want to look at that because some of those have that percent patient total that I talked about in it. Look at that. Some of them are just just e easy. I mean, med there's med Oh my gosh. MedRec. Everybody does MedRec. Use of the HIE. If you are connected to the HIE and you're receiving results, you're you're there. You're there on that particular measure. Um, and there's there's you know tons of other things that you obviously are doing, especially in the chronic care and and uh, transitional care area that are easily picked up, but, but do look at the measure. Here's the second part of the list, where you have um, the ones that Scott and I think are very, very easy to document, and that would be like your clinical decision support area. Yeah, and if, you're, if you have CDS rules set up to support your quality years, measures. Yeah, and they, and they would have done it for meaningful right, years. Right, and so. those, are, those present to everyone in the care team, well, heck, I mean, that's an easy one. That's a no-brainer. Yeah, and some of this is technology-oriented in the sense of patient portal. You know, it depends on which portal you have on if you have some of the interactive features they're talking about where the patient can enter information. But again, look at that. If your portal's set up that way, you automatically are going to get those points just documented in your record for audit purposes. Okay, now, as we move into the next area, we're going to be talking about the, the third thing that you need to be aware of, and that is the ACI or the technology area. And I'm going to turn it over to Scott to save my voice for the end of the <laughs> presentation, since I ran out of voice before the end of it yesterday. So, All right, we're going to do a deep dive into the ACI or meaningful use, or sometimes called the technology area. Um, and, and really, this is intended for the folks that are going for that bonus, that, that want to do more than just the minimum to avoid penalty. So for the ACI score, those items listed in red in the middle column that say required for base score, if you're doing those, you automatically get 50% of the total maximum in the ACI score or ACI area. So if you've done your security review, you're using ERX, and that's a yes, no. So if you've done at least one patient, you're using ERX. You push the information to the portal for at least one patient, and you send at least one 
electronic transition of care or electronic referral, electronic summary, as it's, you know, this measure is often referred to by multiple names. If you've done that for one patient, then you've met the minimum requirement. That's 50 points. You, to get 100% or 100 points in your ACI, then there's a scoring methodology that we're going to talk, we're going to look at a little bit more, but it's more or less the old meaningful use measures. You're going to get a score for that. Um, and you don't have to worry about your thresholds, right. but you just get more points the better you do in right. each category. Right. The thresholds go away, but then again, really kind of so do the exclusions. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the measures. You won't see CPOE. So there's less to enter during the attestation process. But you have the, the two portal measures that did you push the information over to the portal to provide patient access? Then they have the VDT or API, which is did the patient actually go in and click around and look? Patient education, secure messaging, the electronic referral or electronic summary of care, MedRec, and th those are all scored. We're gonna, again, we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. Immunization reporting, it's a yes and no, so it's either zero or 10%. And then you get a bonus for the other registry, syndromic and specialized registry. And then if you look at the report improvement activities using CERT, that very bottom line, that's what Kathy spoke about earlier. What you do to apply that bonus is you add up your score and then you calculate the 10% bonus. So if you're at 99 or 90%, your 10% bonus is going to be 9%, 9 points. Yeah. So you're at 99. Take a, a 10, no, they just add 10% right off, right off the total. So you'd be at 100% right there. So okay, how do you calculate the points? And again, remember, these four red ones, the items listed in red, you do those, you have 50 points. To get the rest of your points, you just take the percentage for that measure, Let's say on patient, um, uh, we'll say the, the patient education. Patient education, let's say your provider got a 50%. Well, that's five points, 5% 5 that's going to get added to that 50% that you got just for doing the minimum. But if they did 67%, then you're up at 7%. Right. So, so use this little chart to kind of calculate the transition over to the MIPS score. Now there are several measures where you get double credit that provide patient access or the, the first portal measure and then the electronic summary of care. Let's say you got a 20% in that. Well that 20% would normally be two points, well now it's four, it's a double. The provide patient access, that one is so easy. We generally see 85% or above on meaningful use. So if you got Let's say you got 100% on your provide patient access. You pushed every piece of information over to the portal. You got 20 points. 20 points towards the 100 that you need. There are over 140 points available in, e in the ACI. You should have no problem getting to right. 100%. And, and the thing that you want to keep in mind here, this is the place where uh, even if you're reporting as a group, you may just want to pay attention to how to handle these these physicians. If you have physicians, I, I remember under meaningful use, you had physicians who were called hospital-based because they were doing 90% or more of their work in a place of service, 21 or 23, which meant they were either inpatient hospital or they were ED. And so you had a lot of physicians, obviously who fell right into that space, so you're hospitalists, a lot of infectious disease um, practitioners, um, you have your pathologists, radiologists, stuff like this. These people are no longer automatically excluded from MIPS overall. So you want to keep them in your group and you want to do, include them in your quality reporting, your other things. But the, the one place where they can be handled differently is in this technology reporting area. Because it, it, CMS recognizes, and that was oh, pointed out so many times over the past seven or eight years about meaningful use is that it was, they were not being realistic to say that these physicians or these providers needed to attest like everyone else because if they are in the hospital system, first of all, they don't have control over their EHR. They're using the hospital's own system, which is not certified the same as an ambulatory. So they may not even be able to track the same quality metrics and stuff. So CMS is like, okay, we heard you. We understand that that's a problem. 
And so what they did is they reworked this area to make it more um, agreeable to physicians who were in this, this area. And so they dropped the 90% down to 75%. So if they're 75% hospital-based or ED, and the third thing they did is they changed the, uh, they added a category. And they said that if you're, if you build POS 22, which is out, hospital outpatients, so say it's an ambulatory surgery center or some of the other outpatient functions in the hospital, then these providers can be, they don't have to be, but they can be excluded from your meaningful use or ACI report. And so this, what this would mean is that you would just not take into account their patients when you're calculating your numerator and denominator. But it is up to you. We do have sites and we, and we know of people like surgeons that although they have a high inpatient rate, they do have um, their ambulatory, <coughs> excuse me, and do fairly well on it, so they want to keep it in. So let's just look at a real quick example. In the middle column is the meaningful use dashboard scores for the measures on which you're scored. In this specific example, the, this provider met the, first, the those items couple slides ago that were listed in red. They did their security review, they are doing ERX, and they got at least one patient in the patient access and summary of care. So they got 50%. They got 50 points of their MIPS score. Now, patient access, they had an 80%. Well, that converts over to 16 points because it's a double-weighted measure. Hey, we're up to 66. Uh, electronic summary of care, they had a 9. Well, you round that up to uh, 10. And hey, that's another double weighted, so we got two more points. But you do that for all your measures, your secure messaging, they, they had an 8%, what you rounded up to, to 10, well, that's one point. As you can see, that very easily on average meaningful use scores, this provider got to 110%. They got full credit for the ACI category. Why is that important? Well, ACI is 25% of your, what they call the composite performance score. So that's 25%. Your CPIA activities are another 15%. That makes up 40% of your score. Now, 60% of your score is, um, is going to be your uh, uh, quality. If you get a 70 or above, if you get a C, you're an average student, you get a 4% increase, at a minimum of a 4% increase. Minimum. You may get more than that. You don't even have to be at 70 to get the 4%. But if you want to be included, for any additional bonus uh, dollars that might be available, then you you are trying to score seven year above. And we just made up this example. This is, I mean, don't don't panic if you're trying to figure out where this came. We just took it based upon providers that we know, and um, it just to give an example of how you calculate and work with it. Right. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy to talk a little bit about quality. Yeah, <laughs> for the talking that Very that well. I can do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Quality looks different this year. It's still the number one driver, quality and cost are the, the two big buckets that CMS is really interested in seeing changes in as they, um, you know, get, I'd say more than tweak this system, rebuild the system. And um, all the language in the original legislation showed that quality was a real driver. And just in case you're wondering whether or not this program is going to stay around. When MIPS came about, the original legislation, which is called MACRA, MIPS is the fee for service side of it, um, it was passed by two thirds of the House and two thirds of the Senate in a very bipartisan type of role, which seems unbelievable these days to think that you could have that much agreement. But there was. And with the fact that the um, physician groups wrote a good portion of the legislation. I don't see people backing away from this. I, I can see it being tweaked, but quality is absolutely the driver here. So spend time on this. If you have to spend additional time anywhere, spend it on picking out your measures and seeing how you're doing. So the way this changes from PQRS is in PQRS, you had to report on nine measures. Now you only report on six. 
In PQRS, if you were interested in reporting as a group, it was called GPRO, and you had to register six months in advance to do that, and if you decided at the last minute that that was going to be a problem, you were going to be docked four percentage points just for not reporting under a group G Pro, if you said you were going to, and it registered, we all know nothing changes between June 30th and January 1st. So why would somebody have registered and not be able to do it? You know, or, and, and the domain craziness goes. Yeah, away. that that whole business about 543. You had to have five clinical decision support, and it had to be across four quality measures and track to three domains. It would drive people crazy. Crazy, crazy, and your IT folks were probably even crazier than you were about it because you don't know from one year to the next what your quality reports were going right. to be. And just to find the, the the nine PQRS measures across three domains when you had to meet that requirement, that yeah, was crazy. Yeah, we had people well. who had nine, ten, eleven really good, fine measures, and when we totaled up, they only had two domains, and it was just nuts. But so that's going away. The whole question of what domain you're in is is not there anymore. You do not have any cross-cutting measures this year, but you want to watch that because that can change from year to year. To year. But in 2017, there are no cross-cutting measure requirements. You, but the, the other difference from PQRS, and this is going to affect small practices, so you do want to be aware of this. There is not going to be reporting for measures groups. So we, I think we were up to around 35 measures groups for 2016 reporting. And these were the reports that linked the measures together or grouped them together under one condition or illness or category. It could be they have a diabetes one, they have an orthopedic surgery one, they had an oncology one. I mean, they had more than one of everything, rheumatoid arthritis. And, and the reason this was attractive to small practices is rather than reporting the requirement had been 50% or more of all your Medicare Part B patients, you just reported on 20 patients and you met the requirement. You report on 20 through a data registry and you could meet it. You're not going to be able to do that this year. There's not going to be that same chart abstraction. So just pay attention to that. That is a change in what they do. And, and I think that's the key. There are no options for chart abstraction under MIPS. Yeah, you, you really have to look at how your reports are being run. You do have to show that you're including one outcome or a high priority measure, and I'll show you how you can track that in just one second. And then the, the thing to keep in mind here, because I think it's just so important, is when you're working and reporting as a group, which is why Scott and I just really love the group reporting, is because it doesn't matter what the specialties are that you have reporting under that group. If you have some real oddball subspecialist and everybody else's primary care, you don't have to show that even one patient was covered in that group. If you're reporting at the group level and you're reporting six measures, you don't have to show that that, that specialized surgeon was treating any of the measure, uh, any patients that fell into those measures categories. So, so what you're looking for are any six measures where you had an identified patient population by some, if not all, of your providers. So take the opportunity, since it's really kind of a freeing experience to say, hey, we don't have to worry about whether every single doctor that we report on it, every single provider has quality measures that they can track to, and rather, instead, what you're going to be looking for is look for quality measures where your, it goes to your scope of practice as a practice. So, so you know, generally, what, it, what is it that you're good at? What type of patients do you handle? Do you handle uh, arthritic patients? You know, are the ones there's a whole bunch of uh, measures for rheumatologists, stuff like this. Um, go into the list and go through the measures and look for them. And then what you want to do as the second part is you want to compare those measures against the national benchmarks. And we are sending you information on the benchmarks so that you have some idea of what performance would be considered good. So you, you obviously want to pick measures where you think your group performs well. And it, it, as I said, if you have a blended um, 
practice where some are primary care and some are specialists, but the specialists are extremely strong at what they do. We've seen this at places where, for example, you have a cardiology group that's attached to larger primary care. If those cardiologists are just knocking it out of the ballpark on the cardiology um, quality measures, then use those. Well, especially if report. those measures have a very low threshold right. and you're way above it. Man, right. That could be a big so, win. So really pay attention to the benchmarks. Look through it. Look at ones that you think your practice is doing and then look at the performance rate and see how you're doing. And then uh, track. We always suggest tracking at least 10 to 12 measures because you just don't know how the rest of the year is going to go and you just don't know if you're going to have issues. So. The other thing you want to keep in mind that is a difference from PQRS is, as I said in the past, you always report it on just Medicare Part B. Starting this year, you are going to be reporting on 50% of all your patients and not just Medicare Part B. The um, difference here is in the claims area, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this figure is going to increase to 60% in 2018. So just keep that in mind, and the um, link at the bottom is for the quality metrics that are like the CPIA. You can pull it up and look at each quality measure individually. And again, I would strongly encourage this. We've tried to figure out so the best way to present 250 quality metrics, and this is something CMS, again, did well this year. So go in and use this link. And you can run down all the measures and then click on the measure if you want to see something about, you know, what are they capturing? What's the numerator and denominator? And then the, at the bottom here, this kind of grayish area at the bottom is on every single measure. And it is, this is where you need the information. So you will see that there's a, a number attached to it. So when you, you, when you go to report, you're, you know what you're reporting on. Don't worry about the domain because that's not taken into account anymore. Um, measure type comes into play, but not so much as in the next level down. You see how that's marked high priority measure? Absolutely, that's the one we said, you know, you needed one high priority or one outcome measure. So the outcome measures are listed under the measure type. So this one's an efficiency. There's efficiency in the outcome. So it's either there or it's listed as a high priority measure. So as long as you have one of those, you're fine. But the next category I really encourage you to pay attention to if you are planning to um, try to decide how to report, you want to know because not every single quality measure can be reported in the same way. So um, this one is limited just to registry reporting. So if you're working with a data registry, that's probably going to give you the most options as far re as reporting, um, but there are other options, as we said, to EHR vendor and, and claims, but we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Um, please note, too, the other thing I would say is this particular measure is what we call a reverse measure, and so it is tracking the number of times that there was a scan done for somebody who is a sinus infection within the first 90 days of developing it. So this is one of those cost measures where CMS wants it to be as low as possible, that you're not doing it every time they come in, into play. What, what I'd say on the measures is you can report your quality measures for a three months period if your reports look good, but consider running them for the full year because there are certain measures some of the reverse measures and some uh, for other reasons, like A1Cs, where um, the longer period of time will give you a better result. And, and let me explain why. In diabetes A1C, part of the report is, are the patients out of control? But the second part of the report is, have, has there been an A1C run during this period of time? And if it ha hasn't been run, and then those patients are considered technically out of control under that measure, even though we know that they probably had an A1C a month or two before. But if you're doing only a three-month reporting period, it gives you less of an opportunity to present a good picture of the cases. So keep that in mind when you're looking at your quality. 
Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Scott to talk about transmission because there are so many different ways in which you can report this year and you are going to want to give some thought to this um, as you're developing your strategy. All right, first uh, option that's available is claims. A lot of small practices have used claims submission for PQRS in the past. Now, with the claim submission, this is the uh, one of the options that allows for you to not report on 50% of all your patients, but just your Medicare patients. Registry reporting. Kathy and I are a huge fan of registry reporting, and I'm going to share a little bit more here in a few slides about why that is. But this is an option we, we strongly suggest that you uh, take a look at. Um, if you are in a small practice, the direct EHR or the vendor submission can be extremely simple. Most vendors do charge a nominal fee for this service, but what this would allow you to do is, you know, if you're an All Scripts client or a Greenway or whoever your vendor is, contact your vendor, say you want to do submission. At the end of the year, um, the, the vendor takes care of, of running all the reports in the background and submitting everything, and it just it takes no effort on the, on the part of the practice themselves. Not to say you shouldn't monitor things, you yeah. shouldn't do, go through the necessary training, ensure that you know where to click for the workflows, but as far as the submission, very, very simple. Yeah, but, but there is a cost factor there, yeah. and if some of the vendors don't charge at all for that, and others charge uh, a pretty penny. So you, you just really have to have that discussion with your vendor when you're trying to figure out what you want to do. Then there are also the qualified clinical data registries. These are generally the specialized regis registries like the ortho registry or, or, or some other of the clinical specialties. And for your ACI and CPIA, there's always the tried and true attestation. Yeah, and, and before we get off that one, the one thing I'd want to say too, the one that we don't have listed because I don't see any small practice doing it themselves is that you can report your quality through the Medicare portal, um, the CMS portal, but if you do that, you're basically reporting the same measures that an ACL would report. So you've got like 30 some measures. So, so technically you could do that too, but really these are the main ways and right. if you notice and Scott's going to talk about this on the next slide, but you notice each one of these has certain categories that um, you can report under in that particular reporting method. So again, you can use any of the forms on the last slide for your submission, but you got to make sure that you submit data for the three required areas, the uh, ACI, quality, and CPIA activities. You also see, if we take a quick look, like with claims, claims you can only do the quality, so you still would have to go through the attestation process. Um, also, a, again, um, you do not have to pre-register. If you're going down the, the route of the group reporting, you do not have to pre-register, the one exception being the CMS web interface. Don't do that. Or CAPS. If you're or using CAPS. the CAPS, the patient satisfaction survey, you do have to register in advance for that. But those are the only two exceptions that requires free registration. And that CMS web interface, a lot of work. Now, technically, you could do chart abstraction with the CMS web yeah. interface, but you just don't want to go down Yeah, that but the, the thing you want to keep in mind on this is if you decide to report as a group, this is really an important point. You have to continue to report as a group across all three areas. Right your ACI, your um, quality, and your uh, clinical practice improvement. It's just a requirement that CMS has made that they want you to be consistent. So if you're reporting as a group, develop your strategy around that particular group reporting. If you're reporting individuals, you will have to do each and every individual with their own six measures for quality, their own CPIA activity, and their own meaningful user technology report. Now we're going to share a little bit about data registries. The rules clear throughout the rules. They really they're pushing the use of data registries because, quite honestly, it makes CMS's life a little bit easier. They've only got you know they got a very limited number of organizations that they have to process the data for, and they get it in a very specific manner. The reason I like data registries is thinking back to the quality. The requirement is that you have to report on at least 50% of your patients. Well, most of your EHRs can uh, generate a QRDA file. This will have all the patient level data for 100% of your patients. The good data registries will take that file, you upload it to the registry, 
They'll run it through their reporting engine and boil that 100% down to the best 50% of your patients. So let's say you had, in controlling high blood pressure, you are at 40% with 100% of your patients. You boil that down to 50%, you might be up 60, 70%. So you can, you can really paint the best picture of yourself through the use of a data registry. Now again, there, there is going to be a cost for that. And also the data registries are certified to submit all of the required reporting elements or categories, your ACI, right. your CPIA, your, your quality. So it's a one and done. Now the qualified clinical data registries, now again, these are generally run by your specialty societies. They may have a more limited scope of the quality measures that they are certified to submit, and they may or may not have the ability to boil that 100% down to 50%. Check with your, your, uh, your specialty society, see what they can do for you, but by all means, if this is an option for you, it may be one you want to further explore. Yeah, so again, we have a link built in here for you, and this is the pr proof list of registries that includes both what we used to call the PQRS registries, they now just call data registries, and those qualified clinical data registries, which are the specialty societies. There's a lot of variation amongst the specialty societies as to their skill level at accepting reports, but you'll know if you're in a specialty, you know, if your group's uh, able to report there. But do look at that, that's uh, well, well over 100 groups are qualified data registries now, and so you want to look at that, and on that list, it will, they have to state on the list whether they only accept quality reporting or if they can also accept the technology reporting and the clinical practice improvement. You do not have to be consistent. You can report to a data registry for the quality and do your own attestation for the uh, meaningful use or ACI and the CPIA. CPIA, as I said, is just a yes, no yes, answer. But you, so do whatever you want. CMS likes it if you use the same reporting uh, transmission method for all three, but you're not required to do it. So it's whatever you're comfortable doing. Right, and, and the final advantage for the data registries is that they, most of them can accept multiple sources of information. So if you've got a traveling provider who's using three different EHRs, or you can supplement with billing information, you can definitely, definitely, definitely get the best picture of yourself. Right. So let's kind of do a quick recap to see what you want to be thinking about when you try to structure your strategy for this year. Is there any reason not to report as a group? You know, is, is there anyone who's like kicking their heels and, and wants to know how they're doing individually because they may be getting judged on their quality reporting? That's one thing, but there are restrictions with how far that goes as far as some of the alternative payment models. But is there any reason not to report as a group? If you decide to report individually, do are there any providers in the group that would be excluded due to low volume? That's not really an issue at the group level because once you decide to report as a group, they apply that low volume to the group as a whole. But if you're reporting individually, then you have to look at each and every provider and decide whether there's an exclusion there for low volume. And CMS is going to be sending out letters, so we've heard, to all the providers to say whether or not they are excluded and whether, whether or not they are determined to be hospital-based. Right, right. But, but the reality is you, you're going to know pretty much in a year. It, it's, there's an eligibility period, but pretty much in a year's time, does that provider take less than 100, not patients overall, but Medicare Part B patients. If they, if they saw less than 100, they would be excluded or they're billing less than $30,000 to Medicare Part B. So for example, pediatricians are probably going to fall into this as, as a group. Um, then the other thing is, are your practitioners practicing under more than one tax ID? And this is important. A lot of groups segregate their billing into different tax IDs depending on the payer and stuff. If they practice under more than one tax ID and you bill Medicare Part B under both tax IDs, you need to report under both tax IDs. It's the change in the way that things are reported. So it looks more like PQRS where your reporting was linked back to your tax ID and the NPI combination. And this is how it's going to continue with MIPS. 
are you documenting the practice improvement areas that you need for credit? And as we said, although it's a yes, no, you want to make sure you're well documented and that you're running it so you can get 10% bonus points under the technology area. Has the practice been implementing the CPI activities for at least three months or whatever the requirement is for those measure, for that measure? Uh, what can you do to improve your meaningful use score? Lots of easy things. Scott covered a lot of it. Just look at that now and, and think about it, especially if you're doing group reporting. And uh, the last thing I would say before we, we close down is that don't forget if you have Medicaid, Medicaid meaningful use, you will continue to report that separately to draw down your EHR incentive dollars and that does still have thresholds attached to it. Now there are several groups out there that have received CMS funding to assist small and rural providers with the challenges presented by MIPS and MACRA. One of those groups is the Alterum Institute, then you've got the National Rural ACO and Health Services Advisory Group. And again, these groups are funded through grants to assist those small and rural providers. And if you're struggling, this is where you may want to start. Yeah, and HSAG, the bottom one, does a very fine job with quality. That's really where they're, they began as an arm of CMS. And so they specialize in that. So they're, obviously, you're more than welcome to reach out to us with any questions. Absolutely. But uh, you know, these are groups that that are being trained basically by CMS to help. So with that, why don't we see if there are any questions? Oh, we got a few questions this time. All right. Question one: Is this for group reporting as well? We have, we have some practices that are PCMH certified, but others that are not because they are specialists and don't qualify for a PCMH certification. Okay, if the group is, uh, the, the general rule is if you report as a group and you have one CPIA activity for one provider in the group, it will cover the whole group. And so what you want to look at here is are they under the same tax ID? That's, that's usually your deciding factor. Um, and I know we've seen this with a lot of large groups is it's a mixed bag where you may have three out of ten practices um, PCMH certified. But I would say, and, and we track that into the reg, there is a specific line that says if one provider in a group is doing a clinical practice improvement activity, it does cover the group. Next question, how will we know which of our eligible clinicians are hospital based under the new payment model? The, you will know because you can either calculate it, there's a look back period which extends from uh, September 1st of 2015 through August 31st of 2016 or you can wait for, you can wait for CMS to let you know. Um, it's easy enough to set up the report and see but I think most of you will usually know right off the bat who's going to fall into that category. We plan to focus on ECQMs for quality reporting. Does our EHR vendor need to do something different to extract ECQMs for patients covered by all payers in 2017 compared to Medicare-only beneficiaries? You're definitely going to want to talk to your EHR vendor on this one, but if you think back to the Meaningful Use program when you would generate your Meaningful Use and CQM reports, those CQM reports were all payer quality reports. So my guess is most of the vendors can already do this but definitely is worth an inquiry to a quick call to, to your, uh, your account specialist or to your vendor just to say, how hard is this going to be? Right, and it's really driven more by your billing system than your EHR system. So uh, that's, if there's going to be an issue, it's going to be around the billing side of it um, as to how it, it tracks reports. But if, if you'd ask this when... Meaningful use first started, I'd say it would be iffy as to whether all the all the um, vendors could do it. I don't think that's true now. I yeah, think this, all, the all CQM reports use. have always been all payers, all patients. Um, now, there's maybe some issues with mapping and whatnot, but I think folks will be fine with this one. Let me check one other spot to see if we have any questions submitted under our chat window, and we do not. Okay, with that, I thank you so much for joining us, especially this late in the day, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk to you later. Uh-huh. Bye.
Bye.